adding what the carbonyl functional groups are and um, start talking about, about some carbonyl reactions because they behave really similarly to some of the other mechanisms we've seen. So just to, to recap, the very first mechanisms we added were substitution, nucleophilic substitution and elimination. Then we added electrophilic substitution. And now we're gonna add nucleophilic addition when it comes to um, when it comes to carbonyl compounds, and really, it's a lot like we've already seen some examples of it. The reduction of carbonyl compounds is a nucleophilic addition. You're just using hydrogen as the nucleophile. But if we can do that with hydrogen as the nucleophile, we can do that with a lot of other things as nucleophiles too. So we're, that that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time today. Um, and just because I had, I had a student on one of the quizzes turn this in as their work. Um, and I thought it was brilliant. I could actually, I could follow their logic, um, which maybe that says something about how my brain works. Um, but this, you know, after all of that writing and arrows here and there and stars and boxes, the no reaction is their final answer. And just made me think of, of this scene. Um, but this is exactly the right way to take tests that are graded qualitative or that where you get partial credit, especially my tests, because like I said, the more this would be right, except it was a strong deactivator. So no reactions so seeing all of this, including the mechanism that goes with it allows me to give, even if the no reaction wasn't right, I can give almost full credit for this because I can see everything ideally, maybe a little bit neater, a little bit less schizophrenic looking. Um, but at the same time, um, it works. So I, I keep that as an example of this is a perfect way to take one of my tests, despite what it looks like. So they still do. I love that scene. Yes, yeah. so, uh, Christina just did not have time for that that day. <laughs> um, all right, so this was slide we ended on. So I don't think we need to go over these um, in much detail here. We've gone over these before. Um, but just a quick recap, the first one would be a nitration followed by reducing the nitrogen to an amine. Second one would be a Friedel-Crafts acylation followed by reducing the carbonyl to, an alk to a benzylic alkane. Um, the third one is going to be Friedel Crafts alkylation. And thank you, Hannah, for bringing up after, was after class or at break that the, um, the alkylation doesn't, um, that is one that we talked about doesn't have great yields. And in fact, it has so such low yields that it only takes one strong deactivating group to completely eliminate it. You can't do a Friedel Crafts alkylation if there's a single nitro group there. Um, for most of our other reactions, it takes until there's there's two or three deactivating groups before it really slows them down. But for the alkylation, it's so low yield anyway that one strong deactivating group is all it takes. And then the last one is a oh sorry, and then the the second step, second and third steps here led to the benzylic oxidation to carboxylic acid. And then the last one was the Friedel Crafts alkylation in the para position with excess NBS means you're going to brominate it three times. And there's no benzylic hydrogens. And actually, we did not specify on C that there was just notice we only said that. It that it oxidizes one of the benzylic carbons, but there are two benzylic carbons with hydrogen. So we would actually wind up with paraphthalic acid or terephthalic acid. At least the, at least they, at least they rhyme. So the first intermediate. like that and then the further oxidation 
gives us the dicarboxylic acid, which is known as the, the general form is phthalic acid, but if they happen to be para, it's called terephthalic acid or para phthalic acid or for phthalic acid. Um, basically, we have redundant systems for, for saying where that is. The common name would be, I think it's T-E-R. You might get some funny looks, but everybody would know what you're talking about. So, and that that's what makes it a good name. Um, and it's one of those things that a working chemist who doesn't work in in with this molecule might not even know terephthalic acid. You know. So even if you work in organic synthesis, that name is not like if if that's your field or that's a molecule you deal with all the time, you'll know that name um, just from from proximity. But calling it um, you know, dicarboxylic benzene dicarboxylic acid would not be wrong. Um, you can even call it carboxybenzoic acid. Because if you've got a, carbox, a carboxylic acid and you're naming it as a prefix, you use the carboxy as the prefix. So you can even do that. Um, again, the main thing with these names is that they're unambiguous, that anybody who knows the rules will be able to get to the right structure. But the, I'm actually out of curiosity, since we're talking about this, let's put it in Molview and see what Molview says. It's not going to look pretty, but so it does give us terephthalic acid, and it says terephthalic acid is a benzene dicarboxylic acid. So right there in the Wikipedia definition. Um, is one of three possible isomers. Yeah. Others being phthalic acid and isophthalic acid. I believe isophthalic acid is the meta version, and phthalic acid is when they're ortho. So, and just a reminder that that happened at both of those carbons. We oxidized both of them because they both. The key is you need a benzylic hydrogen for that me mechanism to work. You cannot reduce a T butyl group to a, to a carboxylic acid that way. All right, so questions on aromatic substitutions. John, wait for by your head. All right, so let's get into some new, or at least review stuff. Um, so these are these are the main carbonyl functional groups that we're going to be working with, and they really, for for whatever reason, this is the one failing I found with this textbook is that it doesn't differentiate easily. Um, most the, the other two textbooks that I've used to teach this class differentiate between the acid derivatives, which are the ones in the red box, and the carbonyls that aren't acid derivatives. Um, and they refer to them as class one and class two carbonyls. Class one carbonyls are defined by having a good leaving group attached to the carbonyl carbon. So basically something electronegative, more electronegative than carbon, which makes them all the same oxidation state. And so if they're all the same oxidation state, it's really not that hard to convert back and forth between them. It's a reversible reaction um, to convert back and forth between any of these, really. Obviously, there's some that are going to be more favorable based on, on sterics, based on electronegativity and resonance. 
Um, but it's not that hard to take the most stable one, which is an amide, and convert it to an acid anhydride, which is the least stable. You can do that, it just takes a little bit of work. And acid anhydrides will spontaneously rearrange to make an amide if you, if you expose them to nitrogen. So those are, that's its own sort of category of reactions. Um, and so they easily go through substitution reactions because you've got that good leaving group. Any decent nucleophile can come in here, displace a good leaving group, and you've got your new molecule. Just like so the mechanism looks a little bit different than an SM2 or an SM1. It's really its own mechanism because you don't have to have your leaving group leave first. And we'll spend more time with this, but just broadly speaking, the first step for a, for a uh, acid derivative substitution is you take this carbon, the carbonyl carbon, and turn it to an sp3 carbon. Your nucleophile can just come in and attach to that carbon and break the pi bond, and you just find it with an oxygen with a negative charge. And then it reforms the carbonyl when the leaving group leaves. So you never actually have a carbocation, which makes it pretty stable. And you also don't need to push the leaving group off at the same time as your nucleophile gets there. So it makes it a, a very friendly reaction as far as reversibility goes and far, as far as how easily it happens. Um, the other two categories or the other two key, uh, groups, class two carbonyls don't have a good leaving group. And so because they don't have a good leaving group, you're more likely to have them react through an addition mechanism. And you do that just the same way. Um, you have a good nucleophile come in and attach to that carbonyl carbon, and but you just don't have a good leaving group. So that oxygen stays with a negative charge until it gets protonated instead. So typically those are going to be reduction reactions if you're using a hydrogen or a carbon-based nucleophile. But if you use an oxygen or a nitrogen-based nucleophile, they don't wind up changing the oxidation state of that carbon. And so you, you wind up with a somewhat reversible addition reaction um, where you can take that aldehyde, for instance, and turn it into a diol, for instance. Right? And just as a reminder of how the, the um, Nomenclature goes for aldehydes and ketones. Really, all of these are, are fairly straightforward. Esters and amides have their own their their own tricks because you have to be able to name what's on both sides of the functional group. So an acid always has to happen at the end of a carbonyl or end of a carbon chain, right? Because that's a carbon that has three things attached to it as its functional group. And so it has to happen on carbon one. And so that means naming carboxylic acids is really straightforward. You pick the carbon that has the acid group and that's carbon one. And then you just drop that E from, from the alkane name and add an oic acid. Esters and amides are a little trickier because the ester, you have to name both sides of these. And so there's a, there's a little trick to that. And we'll spend more time with this. Today's lecture is more on the aldehydes and ketones, but just so you've seen it once. Amides are really straightforward unless you have an R group on the nitrogen. If it's a secondary amide, you have to name what's on both sides of this group as well, just like the esters. So that gets a little bit tricky as well. But aldehydes and ketones, they're really straightforward. Aldehydes, just like carboxylic acids, have to happen at the end of a carbon chain. So it's always carbon one. Um, and ketones have to happen in the middle of a chain. So you have to specify where that, that ketone is, but you just do that with a number. So you could get, so propanone doesn't need a number because it has to be on carbon two. But for instance, if you had pentanone, it could be on carbon one or, car or carbon two or carbon three. So you could just say two pentanone or three pentanone. The other nice thing about these is because we have an sp2 carbon in all of these functional groups by definition, it means we don't need to worry about stereochemistry. There's no R in the F, no an R and S, 
right? Because you can't have four different substituents attached to a carbon that has a pi bond. So in aldehydes, you just and you just name them just like an alcohol, except instead of OL, it's AL. Um, the more, especially if you want to be explicitly clear that it's not an alcohol. Um, typically, all, what I do is I just overemphasize the AL. So I would you know, just pronounce it ethanol and almost overstress the AL to make it clear it's not ethanol. Um, the other way to make it unambiguously clear is to just instead of saying al, they say the whole functional group, ethanaldehyde is more the old school way of naming it, but it's when you're speaking, it's a lot easier to make sure that that's not misinterpreted. Um, when you're writing it, it doesn't, you know, write it a short way because you should not look at that, assume that that's a typo and that they meant ethanol. Um, so take them at their word. If you see that word written like that, or if you're worried about that, just say aldehyde. Um, so by definition, aldehydes and ketones don't have a good leaving group like we mentioned. And so the difference is just the aldehyde has a hydrogen attached to the carbonyl and the ketone has two R groups, has two carbons attached to the carbonyl. Right, so they behave very similarly. They're different in their reactivity. In general, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Um, but overall, they're going to go through pretty much all the same reactions because it's basically the same functional group. Um, it's just a matter of do you have one electron donating group or two electron donating groups? And so, so let's let's do a thought experiment here. And they already mentioned that the primary reactions that these go through are nucleophilic substitution or nucleophilic additions at the carbonyl carbon, would you expect the aldehyde or the ketone to be more reactive? Why? There's more electron donating groups, which means that, that carbon is more stabilized because the carbon in, in the carbonyl group, it's getting its electrons sucked away by the oxygen, right? So if you have more electron donating groups, then that means that you can make that carbonyl carbon a little bit more stabilized. Basically, if you've got a- I just thought it would be more like points to react. There's that too. When we, we'll talk about, when we get to talk about alpha, alpha carbon reactions, those are reactions that happen here. And that for those, you're absolutely right. But for, for nucleophilic additions, for both of these, you have partial positive, partial negative, right? Which, which of them is, if the R group is electron donating, which one is a nucleophile going to be more attached to or more attracted to? less electron donating group because it has, because it has less electron donating groups, it's not as covered up. Basically that positive charge, the partial positive is more exposed on an aldehyde. So you're, you're right on your logic for thinking about it as electron donating groups. Um, and for alpha carbon reactions, you're right. It does have more points of reaction. So it's more reactive, but for the substitution in, um, reaction or addition reactions, the aldehydes are more reactive, just like that's the first time I've tried having students work that logic through before I actually show you the mechanisms. So I wasn't sure how that was that was going to work out. So thanks for playing along. Yes. Okay. I'm quietly open up the snack. Um, just because every time we introduce a new functional group, it's fun to talk about what some of the common versions of that are. Um, and so here are some, some examples of class two carbonyls that show up in everyday life. Um, 
vanillin and vanillin, cinnamaldehyde, and benzaldehyde are all aldehydes. Carbone is a ketone. So anything that ends in own, where the common name ends in own, you can be pretty sure that it's got a ketone. At least one form of it has a ketone. We're going to find out that there are some ketones that under physiological conditions will rearrange into other forms. Um, so it might not look like a ketone when you see the physical structure in a cell. Um, but if it ends in O-N-E, rest assured, it has a ketone form. It just not, might not be the common form in a cell. Um, I do know of one exception to that. What's that? It's the, you know, where, where is an unfortunately chosen name it just has a long Hydrocarbon nitrogens. Uh, Is that nitrogen on it? No. So it's really unfortunately named because azo usually means nitrogens and own usually means ketones. So it's got two misnomers of the same name. Um, these when some of them as well show up in in sugars. Um, sugars are usually classified as being aldoses or ketoses depending on their molecular, molecular structure. So if I'm remembering this right, um, glucose is a aldose and fructose is a ketose. And the only difference between them, and but neither of them has an aldehyde or a ketone. I need those markers back. Um, the only difference their structures on, when they're in their most common form in the body. I'm going to mess up the stereochemistry here. I believe that's fructose, but I might have those pointing the wrong way. The general structures, right? Versus. Glucose, and again, I'm probably going to mess up the stereochemistry here, but it's something like this. Aldose, ketose, despite the fact that they don't, doesn't look like they have an aldehyde or a ketone, but when you put these under slightly acidic conditions um, or in physiological conditions, this ring structure can open up. And you wind up forming what's called a straight chain form, which for glucose looks like let's see, one, two, three. Basically, you wind up with an aldehyde at the top and then a bunch of oxygens hanging off on each side and all the way down. And here you wind up with when it opens up, you wind up with. that looks like that. So it is a ketone when it's in its open chain form. It is an aldehyde when it's in its open chain form, but the form that's most you most commonly see it as does not have either of those two functional groups. Right. So you know, we'll talk about those reactions, um, how you can get from one form to the other form. And it's basically that the the addition reaction that we're going to talk about today, one of the OHs that's attached down here can swing around and attach there and break that ketone into being a depropanated oxygen. And same here, you wind up with an oxygen from the very bottom attaching there and breaking the pi bonds to make it and then reprotonating the oxygen there. And so that's a very specific example that's more complicated than the basic examples, but that's the whole mechanism basically. Nucleophile is attracted to carbonyl carbon because it has a partial positive. Um, the other common place you see ketones is in a lot of um, a lot of hormones like progesterone, testosterone um, are both named that because they have ketones attached 
their derivative form or they're derived from molecule that starts as an oxygen or as a um, alcohol cholesterol is the starting point for making most hormones um, and it just takes a quick oxidation reaction at one of those alcohols to turn cholesterol into testosterone um, i think there's one other substitution that happens i think maybe, maybe an elimination i think cholesterol doesn't have that as a high bond and it has that oxygen is no h so so two quick reactions it's not very far and you can see how structurally they're really similar too. It doesn't take much to get from cholesterol to either of these or from one of these to the other, which is why it's really, really hard to separate out certain, um, certain biological processes are almost impossible to separate from everything else in the body, especially when you get into hormones and neurotransmitters. You mess with one of them, you mess with everything, which we, and we just still don't, fully understand how that process works. We talk, you know, people like chemists and biochemists and um, people with recreational interests in drugs um, like to talk about, oh, this compound, you know, elevates your dopamine and I get some serotonin effects from it. Or, you know, if we just, if we medicate this person and elevate their serotonin, that's gonna take care of these problems here. But we can't really conclusively say that it's just one neurotransmitter because if you change one of them, they all get changed. And we, all we know is really that they're correlated. When you increase one concentration, it's correlated with a certain consciousness effect or a certain mood effect. But we don't know that it's causing that because everything is so interrelated. Do you have any concerns about uh, like making testosterone? how it would affect your bones, make them more um, fragile. And so there was like other things that you want to change if you were taking testosterone um, to like help your bones, you know, that could be a Well, so I do know that, that there are a lot of changes. Anytime you, you introduce changes to physiology of, of a human body, um, like I said, there's cascade effects that are sometimes hard to predict ahead of time. And so, so like, for instance, um, I'll, I'll use my wife as an example. She's pregnant right now. Um, and that causes lots of hormone changes. And essentially, um, she became lactose intolerant as a result of the pregnancy. But that means that she, that you have to be worried about calcium deficiency because if she's not getting calcium from the normal sources and the, the way that the hormones are distributed, they will preferentially leach calcium from her bones to, to provide to the fetus for growth. So there's a lot of things that you wouldn't think are necessarily related. Why would a pregnancy cause lactose intolerance? And why would, you know, and, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you can understand why, it's, you know, stealing from the mother's body to give to the fetus might be an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like, it's, it's really hard to predict just all the intricate ways that these processes interact, which is why every drug has side effects. And even naturally occurring molecules like testosterone, when you change those or elevate those in the body are gonna have other effects as well. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's very convoluted and we don't understand. We're like on step one of 300 when it comes to understanding how these processes interact with each other. We understand them in a yeast cell and maybe in, in mice, probably not even in mice really that well. Um, that's why they're starting to do experiments with mice where they do things like, you know, electrically stimulate one part of the mouse's brain to see what happens to its cognition over here on the other part of the brain. But we're still at the very, very rudimentary stages of, of understanding how these things all work together. It is fascinating though. I think that's gonna be the biggest area of research is going to be in biological systems, um, biochemical systems and in, in uh, neurology, especially looking at, at how consciousness is affected by these various chemicals 
um, and how they all play together. But that's pure speculation. All I know is I find it really interesting. It's really tempting to oversimplify. And every time I do that, I get told off by the neurologist to say, no, that's, you can't make that statement. Even something as simple as dopamine is tied to pleasure and reward might be too much of a generalization for them. Um, so it's, uh, it's very, very complicated. Um, so I have a slide on naming carbonyls. We already talked about it. For the most part, the where it gets a little bit tricky is when you have something directly attached to a ring. And so for the for benzene rings, they mostly have a common name that makes a lot of sense, but it's not technically following our IUPAC rules. So benzaldehyde obviously is benzene with an aldehyde attached, right? It almost goes without saying. But technically, that's not following our IUPAC rules because it's not naming the longest continuous carbon chain that has the, the um, aldehyde at the end. Right? So if we were naming benzaldehyde according to IUPAC names, it would be something like phenylmethanol because the longest continuous carbon chain is just the, the single carbon that has the aldehyde attached. Um, and with that in mind, we don't actually generally use the term methanol in general because we use um, formaldehyde to describe that. And that's a really uncommon molecule in general. And it's a really common term. We never actually observe it as formaldehyde though. Um, it's, you know, I've seen, I've seen um, organic, organic chemists posting names of don't worry, formaldehyde is not real. It can't hurt you um, because it's it doesn't ever exist as formaldehyde, at least not in a solution form. If you put this in water or in ethanol, it rearranges into making some of those those addition products. Like over there, you wind up with water acting as a nucleophile, and you get what's called formalin or methane diol as your more common form in solution. Um, so it's, we call solutions, formaldehyde solutions or formalin is a formaldehyde solution with a set concentration. I want to say it's like 12% formaldehyde by mass or something like that um, is like the, the standard strength. Um, but we don't actually see it as formaldehyde in the solution because, and even if you have pure formaldehyde as a liquid, it'll react with itself to go through some of these. If there's any sort of proton source in there at all, it winds up rearranging to make these, these more complicated structures. What does formaldehyde like do to the body? Because I know I've only like really heard about like formaldehyde in um, like preserving bodies that like animals and stuff. And then people were like, well, it's very sedentary. We were worried about like Wow. like water. What is the like actually? Kill, so kill stuff. It's, it's, it's just it's toxic. It's it. Um, so formaldehyde is actually the reason that methanol is poisonous. Methanol is not poisonous on its own, but the first thing your body does when exposed to methanol is it oxidizes it to make formaldehyde. Because it's the first step of the process of taking an alcohol and digesting it is you oxidize it one step. Um, I think you have to spend an NADH to do it. You have to actually pay one energy or high energy molecule to, to go through the first step. So ethanol gets oxidized to, to ethanol, ethanaldehyde, which is not good for you, but it's not nearly as bad as formaldehyde. Um, so formaldehyde is actually the reason why cheap booze gives you a worse hangover um, is because typically with cheap, especially hard liquor, they don't remove all of the methanol. They increase their yield by leaving a little bit of methanol in basically a level that's not going to kill you short term um, and under chronic exposure. It will, um, which is why you hear about people drinking themselves blind. It's actually the, the methanol in cheap liquor that, um, and the first thing that happens is it, it uh, well, the very first thing that happens is it gives you a nasty headache. 
Um, so the, the headache that you get from cheap booze is actually your body processing the leftover methanol and turning it into formaldehyde. So you're liter literally pickling your brain um, by doing that. And then um, the next thing that happens if you continue to get exposed to formaldehyde is you go blind. Um, and so that's, you know, and then eventually it, it kills your liver even more thoroughly than ethanol does. Um, so it's, it's really common to see that in small amounts in humans, and but it's really good at preventing anything from living, really. So it's really good preservative um, for things that that aren't food grade. You wouldn't use it as a preservative for something that you were going to then eat. Um, but it's very good preservative for biological samples, cadavers, things like that. Um, and the real pro tip is in the comments. Um, if you have one of those formaldehyde headaches from being hung over, the best way to slow that down is to um, add a competitive inhibitor to the process that's making the formaldehyde. So this, since the same enzyme is responsible for breaking down, the responsible for breaking down methanol is responsible for breaking down ethanol as well. If you drink a little bit of ethanol, it actually slows formaldehyde production down while your body deals with the ethanol. And it gives you a chance, your body a chance to clear some of that formaldehyde. So the best, it's not a cure, but the best way to lessen that hangover headache is a couple of Advil washed down with a light beer. Um, because then it's also helping with hydration as well. Yeah, about that I read that Enzyme that's like a alcohol mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like an evolutionary thing. Like we, we acquire more of an enzyme to survive on like a you know, limited amount of fruit, which is fermenting as it ages. So it tolerates rotten fruit pretty much. And then, so that's why it's uh. The, the binding site on the enzyme is like hysterically perfect for ethanol. And then it just so happens that other small alcohols get oxidized as well. And then it's the ethanol that's really bad news. But yeah, so it's selected for ethanol. So that's why that works, is because you're actually displacing methanol from that enzyme to oxidize. Yeah. Well, that's so it goes back to also that um, we talked about how complicated enzyme kinetics gets when we were in lab the other day. Um, so it turns out if you have a fixed amount of enzyme, their total amount of enzyme is a constant. Um, you can essentially remove some of that enzyme from being able to act to make product one by adding the substrate to make product two instead, because you're limiting how much is available, how much enzyme is available. If you think about the enzyme as being a, a shuttle bus to take people from here to the casinos, um, if you add a second pickup spot and the, and the shuttles have to split their time between coming here to pick people up or going somewhere else to pick people up, you can't get as many people from here to the casino, right? So basically you're removing the ability to make some of that product by giving the enzyme something else to do. Um, because the enzyme can't prioritize other than saying, well, this molecule fits better, so this molecule gets preference. And then also, what you're doing in that case is you're giving your like uh, kidneys time to remove methanol from your blood. To do this. Okay. When, and uh, despite how, how applicable this is and how much a cure for hangover would be a you know, billion dollar idea, um, it's really like five things that are happening that, that work together to make a hangover, which is why it doesn't feel as bad as any one of them by itself, um, or it feels worse than any one of them by itself. So, you know, it's dehydration, it's a lack of vitamins, it's having this, the, this formaldehyde around and it's, um, uh, ethanaldehyde is not good for you that's responsible for some of that fuzzy fuzziness um 
but you put all of those together with vitamin deficiency in the process of breaking down these alcohols also depletes um, a lot of water soluble vitamins like B vitamins, especially that are responsible for catalyzing some of these reactions. Um, so you really have to treat all of those things. You need water. You need to give your body a chance to flush out the methanol. Um, you need, and there's several ways you can do that. You need to in, add more B vitamins. Um, and then the other thing is that your body doesn't, your brain does not recover in drunken sleep the same way that it does in regular sleep, which is why even if you pass out for 10 hours, you still wake up feeling tired um, if you're, if you were drinking heavily. And so all of those things together, um, really, I really think that um, energy drinks were primarily developed to be hangover cures because they've got lots of B vitamins, they've got caffeine, they replace some things. They still actually are slightly hydrating despite the high levels of caffeine. Um, the only thing missing is a little bit of alcohol to, to kind of take the edge off while that all gets going. Um, but they tried that and people just started binge drinking four locos instead. So, um, and now so we're going to do that. <laughs> four locos came out when I was when I was in grad school, I spent a lot of my spare time with the townies, for lack of a better term, um, because I liked them better than the other grad students. Me and my, my best friend spent a lot of time with the, the staff at our favorite bar. Uh, he actually lived with them for a while. And actually, it was because it was the ex-boyfriend of one of our co-workers, and we liked him better than her. So when they broke up, we hung out with him instead, and then we wound up spending a lot of time with man. Those bar workers when Fort Loco came out, there was like a 50-50 chance if you saw them out on the town that they weren't going to remember seeing you the next day. That that Fort Loco was not good for anybody, uh, for anybody, period, really, which is why it's illegal now. All right, let's get through this and then we'll take our break and we'll come back and talk about reactions since we've been off topic a little bit. Um, if we have a ring structure with an aldehyde attached to it, we just use this, this prefix. We say cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Carbaldehyde means a single carbon attached to something else. Um, so you just throw that at the end of the molecule's name, you know, cyclopentane carbaldehyde. Um, technically, benzaldehyde should be benzene carbaldehyde if we're using this name structure. Um, and they're fairly uncommon because generally this is going to have a common name. If it's a common molecule, um, very rarely would somebody actually call it cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Average. I don't know what this one's common name is off the top of my head, but, but I almost guarantee that there is one. Uh, and the hydrobenzaldehyde. <laughs> yeah. Deca. Deca hydro. Oh, oh, oh. No. You're right, Penta. Playing math games back there? Oh, you're playing soccer. They, they have like a, a Pokemon style um, it, our adventure game where you go around and collect monsters, but you do it by um, solving math problems um, that uh, he's been into lately, but he's not playing that right now. was playing Prodigy. He blew his mind when, when I had him listen to Bad of the Land, um, the seminal Prodigy album from the early 2000s, late 90s, late 90s, I'd say, as Firestarter on it. Anyway, and we got to talk about ketones. There aren't really any tricky ketones. Um, because if you have a ring structure with a ketone attached, it's at least two carbons long. And so you can name it according to that be, you know, you could have ethanone. Um, the common name is basically to name what's on both sides like it's a branch. So this is the way that you still see it labeled at in, uh, in a lot of hardware stores and solvents. So you have acetone, which could be named with this system as dimethyl ketone. Um, but if you have an asymmetric ketone, a lot of times you could have methyl ethyl ketone. MEK is a classic paint thinner. Um, it's great for 
for artistic purposes and, and as a solvent because um, it works just like acetone except it's uh, evaporates just a little bit slower um, but it's really bad for the atmosphere so it's outlawed in California but methyl ethyl ketone is exactly what it sounds like it's a ketone with methyl on one side and ethyl on the other so the better name for that would be butanone. All right, so here's some practice naming things. We have other stuff going on. Um, let's take a 10 minute break and then when you come back, spend a couple minutes trying to work through some of these and then we'll, we'll do some of these. Oh, some of the answers are already up there. I missed that. When I was doing everything on Zoom, the easiest way to, to work out the problems on the computer screen was to just type them in the text boxes as I went. Um, since you've got plus space, so then it's saved. And sometimes you hit save, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back to 10 after, work on a couple of these, and then we'll get into the reactions. I'm, I'm not looking forward to uh, having a newborn again. I've just gotten used to being able to sleep through the night again. <laughs> I read a study at some point that said that there was uh, that parents spend the first five years of a child's life sleep deprived, like clinically sleep deprived. Um, it takes you five years to recover from that. Yeah. Nice work. Um, and so I'm just recovering from that and now I can start it again. Yes. There are plenty of things about having a new point that I miss, though. They don't talk bad. I can put on whatever I want on the TV. They don't complain. Dash used to watch concert videos with me. Lay on the floor. He'd lay on the floor and uh, watch concert videos. He's PC and Queen mostly. Talking heads, of course, as well. That's such a good concert with you. Stop making sense. Stop making sense. Yeah. And you watched, because I was home all summer with you when you were a newborn, you and I watched Giants every morning. We watched the Giants game. Yeah, there's a few concert videos I always go back to because get used to like a well done artistically done planned out concert video that's quality stuff doesn't cut it anymore <laughs> what's out there you know it's a stop making sense last waltz um, lcd sound system has a really good one but it's in your first with your views video myself but What's that? Yeah, I do like that. I don't even like Pink Floyd that much, but that video, that concert is so good. Actually, Incubus Live at Red Rocks is a really good one too for, for 90s kids. Apparently, they're still touring. I didn't know that the um, Lisa Schaefer who works in the president's office. It's a, it's a, her husband is actually in a touring metal band. Um, or at least they used to be touring. They, now they just do festivals. Um, but she's a big 90s kid. Used to, you know, hard rock 90s band. And she was telling me that Incubus is playing, and I want to say, on Crystal Bay. It's one of the smaller venues in Reno. 
Uh, yeah, I had that. I mean, that was a really good one. Green's reunion, despite the fact that it was a reunion show, was actually okay. You just have to forget that it's Eric Clapton. I hate knowing too much about musicians' personal yeah. lives. Yeah, as a kid, I really liked uh, the dream. Mm -hmm. I sort of rediscovered that. Yeah, it's like Jack Bruce's vocals. So good. And like Eric Clapton, Eric is his way to that. Like, I would say, unlike pretty much the rest of his career, he's like actually like really, you know, the, the really good performance. And uh, yeah, I heard uh, one or two tunes from him. Yeah. I was like, all right. So he still got that fire, but. So, like, they're for arenas now. Right. And then Clapton's guitar playing. I don't like when talented musicians use tone as an excuse to play lazy blues licks when they can play better blues licks. I like lazy blues licks sometimes. But when it's just because you feel music more, is there reasoning? It just doesn't. Like Keith Richards, prime example, lots of lazy blues riffs, but they never come off as like because he can't be bothered to do more. It's, he's making a conscious decision here. I'm doing this here so that I can do something else later. In fact, it never, I never got that vibe, from him, especially as later stuff. Um, plus, once you've heard the, the actual original songs, a lot of Zeppelin and Cream doesn't hold up compared to like the actual 1930s blues musicians. Yeah. Um, like it's good, but I think I, I prefer Robert Johnson's Crossroad Blues to Cream's Crossroad, generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. Oh, um, the, the like two Robert Johnson albums, one of the. Uh, Best contributions, so like because uh, like Adam's like really mm. yeah. got me into what else he did. So I learned, learned from the history of rock and roll. Had access to a lot of really good. Those are actually for me in the four albums. Black Cylinder, right? It's, it's, it's like really good. Like you really hear what's going on. It's like you know, as well as. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I love, and I, that's that's one of the things that as much of a problem as I have with Spotify's business model, in a lot of ways, especially for young artists, or artists who are still living, for artists that are dead. That was my nephew because I don't really think that that's the copyrights or something that should be inherited. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, so I you know I don't have that problem, and there's so much good old old stuff that you can't find any other way other than digitally these days um you know big mama thornton's original first like i can't stand this thing to hold this anymore um well, because I, I never stand this thing to hold this it always struck me as such a yeah um but i mean you know i didn't hear all this like uh, my parents were really like sequential in my music education as a very young kid they, they were like all right like if they heard me listening to any like you know movies or like classic rock they're like you know where this came from right like check this out you know so, so yeah but, but yeah to, totally like, agree that uh, Yeah, or, or so standard. <laughs> yeah, well, I was sufficient to get interested, which is right. So, so, you know, not not like a, a bad part of history, but. And I will, I will give. I love the Rolling Stones. 
because I feel like they're rock and roll where the Beatles pop. Um, and I will always respect them for the fact that on their first American tour, or they, they refused to go on the John, this is the Johnny Carson show or something on one of those late night shows, um, unless they were able to bring Muddy Waters. Um, that, no, 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 we're only here because of this guy. We're going to listen to him because we're in America and I want to listen to him. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they've lost a lot of that fire. They're, they're sellouts now, but they're in their 70s, 80s. They're allowed to be. Yeah. I feel like once you've they reached out, they have a brand. <laughs> right. They might as well cash in. Yeah. And they, were never, they were never progressive. If anything, they were. Yeah. They, they were just popularizing, you know, poor black people's music for the most part. But. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, you know, I saw this uh, interview with Ian Anderson when he was talking about, you know, progressive rock wasn't really, you know, like pursuing all of it from way too far with that. Progressive rock is basically like, we're going to stop playing blues and start doing our own thing based on like the way that we Right. <laughs> so yeah, they, they would go from blues to more jazz almost. And like with a lot of music theory, like they, they did take it further, but at the same time, it was like I mean like with like the LT, they went like way more classical music. Yeah, that's true. And uh some some of the groups, like especially like the Tanner Bird jazz, you know, had stuff that are you know, I think like yeah, Jess were told they, they did it like just right. Yeah. We're just gonna rock out like yeah, there's just some complicated ideas, but we're not like throwing it in the face from some of the music. Yeah, I feel like that's the golden age of, of prog rock is just right when it's riding that line between classic rock or hard rock and progginess. And I, I and same with, with prog metal too. It's gotta be it can't be so inaccessible and it's you know. I get that if you really get into it, there's a lot to it. This it's like reading Ulysses sometimes. Like, I don't always want to read Ulysses. You know, sometimes I want something that I got a little bit of ideas I can dig into that's not 5,000 pages where I have to look up footnotes to see what he meant by that. You know, sometimes I'm okay with that, but not always. Um, Blue Oyster Cult. I like Blue Oyster Cult because they're good, like, Barely proggy, but they're like more progressive than the other pop rock, hard rock at the time. Okay. And she's working up. We'll go visit her just in, um, in just a minute. Back 40 minutes. Okay. You can sit up here and call her if you want. All right. Let's work on naming these. Us. Are there any of them that are particularly tricky? You have to figure out R versus S, which maybe the priority might be the, the thing that's worth revisiting there. So for this first molecule or this first stereo center, the priority. It's only two carbons at the end of the carbon chain here, one, two, or one, two, versus this way, one, two, then an oxygen. So for both of these, the highest priority is going to be, is going to be the direction that points towards the oxygen. And the methyl is going to be the lowest, sorry, the third priority. The hydrogen is not drawn is the fourth priority. So, Three, one, two. You want to have circled in blue there? So we're recording so that you're supposed to watch it later. So be counterclockwise, but we're looking at it backwards. So when you turn around and look at it from this way, and be careful, I'm looking at the same screen as you because this one is facing the other direction. One, two, three, would be clockwise. So the red one is R. 
here you would have, or sorry, the, the blue one is R. One, two, three. It's clockwise, except we're looking at the back side of it again. So that makes it counterclockwise. So the red one is S. So the actual name then, if I erase all of this so you can count everything. It's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six. So hexanone, and it's two hexanone, three, four, five, trimethyl. And it's going to be three R four S three four five trimethyl two hexanone. So that one has about all the trickiness that we can muster here, other than just be one other way of naming these. This would be cyclobutane carbaldehyde. So that's not hard, it's just a matter of remembering if it's an aldehyde attached to a ring, you use that carbaldehyde descriptor. And the other key, and we've seen this before, but really comes is becomes important when we're talking about aldehydes and carboxylic acids, is you have to start your chain with the aldehyde. So even though there's a longer continuous carbon chain, it has to be the longest continuous carbon chain with the aldehyde. I suppose technically you could name that as something carbaldehyde, um, but we really only use that commonly for cyclo groups. So that this one would be one, two, three, four, five. So pentanal. So two propyl pentanal. But other than reviewing those rules, reminding yourself how our regular IUPAC rules work, there's not a whole lot that's different about these. We just added two function groups as well. So we can practice going the other way too. Let's see. Let's draw R three bromo butanol. now. Practice that one. We'll go through. Remember, just try drawing one configuration and figure out if that was the R or the S. So you now one, oops. one, two, one, two, three, four. Um, and it's generally speaking, we usually write the hydrogen, even though for skeletal structure, it's not strictly speaking necessary. If you draw an aldehyde in full view, it won't show that hydrogen, but it does look kind of weird to just end with the carbonyl. Um, because this is the more common way of drawing it. And we start with this version. One, two, three, four is into the board. So I also left out through it right the first time. And again, if you drew it wrong, 
All you have to do is switch any two of those four substituents. So you could keep the bromine pointed out and the hydrogen pointing back and switch two and three. Typically, what's what's usually easiest if we wanted to write it the other way, just redraw it with the bromine into the board instead of out of the board. If you just switch what's in and what's out, it's usually easier. Um, it involves less erasing anyway. You only have to erase one bond to do that. But you can absolutely pick any two of those three to, to switch. So two of those four to switch, and you'll wind up with getting the opposite isomer. All right. The as usual, when we introduce a new functional group, the first thing that, that we see is that it um, it gives us here's how we make these functional groups. And so a lot of times these wind up being reactions. We've already, we've already seen all three of these reactions before. Um, if you want to make an aldehyde, you can start with the primary alcohol and you can oxidize it. But we have to stop the oxidation halfway. So we were limited to these two options. We can't use any of our chromium options or permanganate options um, because they oxidize it too effectively. And then we oxidize it all the way to the, carb the carboxylic acid. So if we want to oxidize it and stop at the aldehyde, we have to use one of these PCC or DMP in dichloromethane or DMSO um, and COCl2, which is going to be a, I believe COCl2 is this molecule. Which would be oxoil, oxoil chloride, maybe. It's the chloride form of oxalic acid. I think I have to write out the whole oxalic, and you drop the ick and write O O Y L. No, just Y L chloride. So it becomes oxalyl acid or oxalyl chloride. I believe, but I've seen like oxal chloride before, but you know, it's like why would it be like oxal oil? So it's because when you make it a carboxylic acid, it's when you add the O, and it so it's it's not oxaloic acid, oh. it's oxalic acid. Um, so ethanoic acid becomes ethanoil chloride. So you leave the O and just and you drop the ick. Because oxalic acid doesn't have the O to begin with, it's just YL. YL. Um, but again, we'll get into that in more detail when we talk about acid derivatives. Um, ozonolysis is another way of make, uh, making aldehydes. If you have a di substituted um, alkene, you can put it through ozonolysis and get aldehydes. That's a little bit more limited because you have to have something that you can break down into your desired aldehyde. Um, so it's a little bit trickier to use that to make an aldehyde, um, but it is certainly possible. Uh, and we also have hydro hydroboration oxidation of terminal alkynes because remember, the first thing it did was make the um, Anti, it's an anti Markovnikov addition that makes an enol, which then rearranges, goes through that tautomerization. So, just to recap, hydroboration oxidation is a hydration on the anti Markovnikov carbon, on the less substituted carbon. So, the first intermediate when you did this. Would look like this, which then rearranges itself to make carbon oxygen pi bond and move the hydrogen over to the second carbon to carbon two. And so you wind up making an aldehyde when you do this to a terminal alkyne. And 
and ketones are made more or less in the same way. The only difference is where your oxygen starts. If you start with an oxygen on a secondary carbon instead of a primary carbon, then when you oxidize it, you get the ketone instead of the aldehyde. And because it's on a secondary carbon, we don't need to worry about going oxidizing it too far. Dichromate can't oxidize past to the point where you remove it, a carbon. So it'll stop after one step of oxidation. Um, so, and again, a lot of, there are a lot of um, oxyanion metals that, that can potentially do this. I think permanganate will do this. It's be a little bit trickier to get it going, but that's a safer option. Um, and probably doesn't get as good a yield, which is why they still have chromate as the textbook example. Um, ozonolysis of alkenes. If you have a alkene that's got two R groups on one side, when you go through ozonolysis, you get a ketone. If you do a hydration of a terminal alkyne or any alkyne, you'll wind up with a ketone because you make the Markovnikov addition product. And then you can also make a ketone with Friedel Crafts acylation. And so again, all these reactions we've seen before, we've already done our addition reactions, our alkene reactions, our alcohol reactions. And so they have this called out in chapter 19 with sections. If you want more details about this, if you're doing a synthesis project, you need the details about, okay, how do I decide what carbon to put this on? Or what are the important details to determine which stereoisomer I get? You would just go back to these other chapters to get more details about it, right? So this is just the, the basics of it. And this does say that an ACL halide, that even Friedel Crafts acylation also won't work if it's strongly deactivated. Um, I think one strong deactivating group would still allow it to react, two strongly deactivated groups would stop it. And if it dealkylation, it only takes one deactivating group. Um, so here's some synthesis style practice for filling in what you would use. And really the way that I would approach these type of questions, now that we have such a back catalog of reactions, is I would, I would try to say, okay, classify this reaction and then try to add the details. Um, so for instance, I would you know, I'd look at this person, oh, that's an oxidation reaction, oxidation of an alcohol and then use that to either try and remember it off the top of my head, at the very least use that to go find the right section where I can, I can do that. So oxidation of a secondary alcohol, chromate works, dichromate. Um, oxidation of a primary alcohol to make an aldehyde, that was a little bit trickier and I don't have those memorized, so I would go back to that section again and, and add that. Um, yeah, what does the PCC stand for? Some polypyridinium chlorochromate. <laughs> Pyridinium chlorochromate. Yeah, I don't have those memorized. I always try to make it a, a different molecule. Um, I think I usually try to make it in, in chloride. And so it doesn't, it never works out properly. Um, but anyway, that's why you have textbooks, right? right? So we can go look this stuff up. You have a device in your pocket with the sum of human knowledge at your fingertips, literally. So why memorize things anymore? Unless you're using them all the time. Um, you know, but here's our it's just, a, it's just a quirk. It is kind of fun to be able to pull that out of thin air sometimes. I do that when um, I impress the uh, the intro to gen chem students because I remember, you know. Oh, I remember doing this problem last year, so I know the answer off the top of my head. It looks like, oh, is this is the one that's 100, it's 115, 114.7 pounds, maybe. Yeah. <coughs> um, e is an interesting one. Until you realize it's ozonolysis. 
Anytime you start with an alkene and you wound up with oxygens attached to it, it's ozonolysis. So it would just be a matter of you know, remembering O3 and second step DMS. And what would the reactants look like for F? That one might actually be the trickiest one as far as drawing this properly. It'll be free old craft isolation, but for some of those, even once you recognize what the product is, figuring out what the reactant is that gives you that is, can be a little bit tricky, at least until you get used to it. Since it's not an alkylation, it'll be that exact same. Structure. Yeah, no rearrangements were needed, at least. It's that same structure with the chlorine where the benzene ring is. So those would be your reagents. Trichloride with that acid chloride, methyl propyl oil chloride, and benzene. All right, so the meat and potatoes here, the new reaction is this nucleophilic addition. And it works just like any other nucleophilic attack. And it, it even works a, a lot like um, our electrophilic substitution. You start by breaking a pi bond to make room for the new electrons coming in. And then the, last, the second step, if it's addition, is that you just protonate. The oxygen keeps the extra pi bond, or keeps the electrons from the pi bond. The nucleophile comes in and attaches to the partial positive of the carbonyl. And that this applies to aldehydes and ketones. And you make a tetrahedral intermediate. If it's an acid derivative that had a good leaving group, the next step would be that you, your leaving group leaves and your tetrahedral intermediate turns back to being a carbonyl. But in this case, we don't have a good leaving group, so we just protonate this oxyanion. Right, so depending on what the nucleophile is, this can look like a lot of things. And this is just an example of um, what computational chemistry can give us. We can look at acetone and say, oh, acetone, you know, oxygen's more electronegative, therefore the, the carbon should have a partial positive. We can actually calculate the electron, the electronic dipole moment of these molecules if we, if we do some of these computational um, methods. And so we can actually make figures like this where blue, blue is a partial negative charge and red is a partial positive charge. Can see very clearly where where a nucleophile would be attracted, right? And it's it gets drawn. This is just a, a artifact of the program that that draws these in three D. The program that actually does the calculations doesn't actually have a, a GUI. It doesn't have any sort of graphics. It just outputs pure Cartesian coordinates um, and a matrix full of of um, wave function values. Um, and so, and when you open the results of that up in this pro, in the graphical program, it just looks at the, the coordinates and says, oh, it's an oxygen atom that's this far away from a carbon atom, draw that with a triple bond. The output from the calculation doesn't actually have any information about whether it's first, second, or, you know, a double or a triple bond. It just says how far apart they are. And so the program then takes that and interprets that and says, well, it's a triple bond then because they're so close together. So that's not terribly accurate on that. If I was, if we were going to publish this, I would go in there and actually change that to so display it as a double bond. Um, but I did not do that since I just did this while students last year were making their, were doing their projects on computational chemistry. I just did this for fun to make that bigger. Um, but they do look pretty, don't they? We have them in three dimensions. Click and drag and visualize this in three dimensions. I 
yeah. programs. So the calculations are run in a program called games um, with two S's, which stands for, I think the G stands for either the name of the group that made it, which is Gordon Group. Um, but it's basically, a, it all runs in Linux and you basically have to make a text file as your input file um, and, and run it in, in a command prompt style. And then it'll spit out a giant text file as a log file that can be in some of these texts. It's a text file that's 120 megabytes sometimes. Um, and, uh, and so then you take that and you open it up in the second program that was made by another grad student in that, in that research group um, that's designed to interact with that type of output file. So it's sort of a, a clunky process, um, but pretty much a, a lot of the programming that's done in quantum chemistry is still done um, sometimes in Fortran still. Um, but in, in really old school programming languages and it's run because they are run so light, they're so low overhead if you arrange them properly um, and you can run them in Linux then. So in Linux, is, you don't need to mess with, with Windows or operating systems, you just use Linux. So, yeah, what? Yeah, so you're actually well set up to keep it actually, but I have to use a tweaked version of games that's tweaked to run in a virtual environment on um, Windows if I want to run jobs on my computer. Um, or I have to find some a cluster, a supercomputer somewhere, a server somewhere that's running Linux that will take my inputs and run the jobs for me and spit in email me my outputs. Um, So anyway, when we when I was doing computational chemistry in grad school, we actually built what's called a cluster, which is basically a mini supercomputer. It's basically a server rack um, where every every blade of the server um, is is basically a super high end motherboard. Um, we had it so that each each server node had twelve processors running, I don't remember what their speed was, but had 32 gigs of RAM on the slow ones and 64 gigs of RAM on the on the big ones, which, and this was 10 years ago. Um, so that was a lot of horsepower. Um, and we had, I think we had a total of 120 nodes on that thing. So you, and you could set it up so you were running across multiple nodes. So some of these calculations will take, you know, 700 gigs of memory to hold all of the wave function components in the RAM while it's doing these calculations and optimizing things. Um, so very, very quickly, you wind up using all those resources if you have them. All right, so if we're under basic conditions, we are really just, this is the process. It's under basic conditions, it looks like this. Because if we were under acidic conditions, you can't make that intermediate. That intermediate won't happen under acidic conditions. So basically, it's the same two steps under acidic conditions. But you have to change them because under acidic conditions, you're going to start with the proton transfer. You're going to start by protonating that oxygen. And then your nucleophile comes in and attacks. It's um, and just like we were talking about earlier, for these mechanisms, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones because the partial positive on the carbonyl carbon is stronger. So because you have two electron donating groups versus only one electron donating group. And that's why formaldehyde is so reactive because formaldehyde has zero electron donating groups. And so that partial positive is really exposed. And any of these nucleophiles are fair game. Oxygen-based nucleophiles, it could be an alcohol, it could be water, it could be a diol. Sulfur-based nucleophiles, nitrogen-based nucleophiles, hydrogen nucleophiles, carbon nucleophiles, these are all fair game. Carbon substituted triphenyl phosphate. Yes, that has a very specific 
use for these. Um, but effectively, that's that's a way we can add just a single carbon. So under acidic conditions, I already said this, and I've spent too much time talking about round topics to let you spend five minutes working on your way through this on your own. But effectively, the rule for acidic versus basic conditions is under basic conditions, you're never going to make something that's positively charged. At least if, if it's a, you're never going to have a protonated um, compound that is positively charged. And under basic or under acidic conditions, the exact opposite, you'll never have a deprotonated form that has a negative charge. So if it's acidic conditions, you have extra H pluses that are going to, that are going to protonate any electrons. And under basic conditions, you have, you're missing H pluses. And so to go backwards, you'll never make that under acidic conditions, and you'll never make this intermediate under basic conditions. So a lot of mechanisms can happen under acidic conditions, and they can also under, happen under basic conditions, but the order of proton transfers change. Acidic conditions usually means you protonate something first. Basic conditions means you protonate something last. But the steps are the same, just the order is switched. Right, and so here are two examples. And so part of the trick is recognizing which is which. This is not always explicitly clear. Um, sometimes it is. If, if HCl is one of your reactants, you can assume you're doing this under acidic conditions. But if a Grignard reagent is one of your reactants, you need to know that that's going to be basic conditions. Because a Grignard reagent is carbon with a negative charge, right? You can't have a carbon with a negative charge if you have H pluses around. If you have H pluses around, they'll just protonate that and you just wind up with your Grignard reagent turning into the alkane. And so you can practice drawing those. Yes, Dash. Um, so, and that's despite all of the late start and getting here and uh, taking our time on the way, um, we did get through all the slides for today. So we can take our time and try drawing these mechanisms, try drawing both of these. Again, the only thing that's different is where the new protein.
first one under basic conditions. Start with the ethyl group. Acting as nucleophile, attack carbonyl carbon. And remember that you need to draw the arrow for the electrons moving to make room for it. Otherwise, you wind up with a, a carbon with five bonds, and we're better than that by now. We were better than that six months ago. And then so you wind up with a deprotonated oxygen anion. The second step is just stealing a proton from a water molecule or whatever your proton source is. It could be methanol, it could be ethanol, or else are both common choices as well. And so you, probably your, your byproduct would be some combination of magnesium bromide and magnesium hydroxide at, by, at the end. And that's one of the reasons why recycling reagents is so hard is you won't, wouldn't get just magnesium bromide you really because the stoichiometry is not right. You would need twice as many bromides for that to happen. So um, unless you made hydrobromic acid, your proton source, which is dangerous for no reason, um, you're just not going to get, I guess it wouldn't be no reason, but not a good enough reason to use concentrated hydrobromic acid. And then for this, so for the second one, we change the order. You start by protonating the carbonyl. So if you start with HCl, lone pair on the oxygen, can come in and steal a proton and chloride um, takes the electrons. And so then you wind up with this intermediate that looks like it's still just a carbonyl, it's just a protonated carbonyl. So you have an oxygen with three bonds, so it's got a positive charge. And then the chloride can act as the nucleophile. But we still have to make room for it. So that's when you break the five bonds. So this is why aldoses and ketoses don't actually stay in their open chain form and why we don't actually have formaldehyde as a molecule because anytime you've got any nucleophile around, it winds up doing some form of this. Sometimes, you know, it can be, if you have a diol, you can wind up with the diol with both oxygens attaching where the carbonyl was. So it, you wind up with these reactions progressing. So it almost just becomes, a, the trick becomes remembering possibilities because there's a lot of possibilities. Um, you know, any of these nucleophiles can come in there and some of them will react more than once. These ones in particular can react twice and you actually wind up removing the carbonyl oxygen and replacing it with this like, five-sided diether or di thioether. So for instance, if you did that with formaldehyde, you wind up um, reacting first to make this molecule. And then this molecule can go through a substitution reaction and kick the OH off. You wind up making this weird looking ring structure where This carbon at the very top is the carbon that was the formaldehyde carbon. Sorry, the one I circled in blue there. And so you wind up with these sequential reactions happening. It's the same mechanism we've seen before. We just understand enough now that we can look at some of them. We can continue that logic. It starts by making a single addition product, and then it goes through a displacement substitution reaction. Um, and so this is a an example is called an acetal. The intermediate where you've done one of the steps is called a hemiacetal. 
and then it goes through the second step and you make the acetone. So that's exactly what's happening with the sugars. You're making the hemiacetal form by having one of the oxygens act as a nucleophile on a ketone or on an aldehyde that's in the same molecule. And you get the open chain form turning into that ring structure. All right, so I believe that's everything relevant for the quiz. I'll double check the quiz to make sure there might be an IUPAC question on esters that we haven't spent enough time on. So if that's the case, I'll change that to something more relevant. Um, but yeah, we're, we're on the carbonyl chemistry. We're done with aromatic chemistry at this point. Uh, and our list of reactions just keeps growing. So we'll keep some form of notes available, some form of cheat sheet available, probably do one side of a whole page um, of notes for the midterm and the final for this class. But I might, in order to make you make use of that, you know, might make have you, um, you know, the, the synthesis question, anything from the whole course, from all three courses is fair game. So that you know, might be advantageous to have a little reminder of E1, E2, Markov, Markov, anti-Markov, that kind of thing. But we'll talk about that more when we get closer to the midterm. It's only week three after all. It feels like more because the snow makes time feel like it's passing slow.